I have to give myself that uh, that quick kind of checkpoint as I go to parse these things together because video and audio are separate. But yeah, no, I don't know that these things have been asked to that level of depth to this point. And I think that they're fair questions, additionally. Um, mm -hmm. Things around, will IPFS and Filecoin stay cost effective in the long term? It's one that I've wondered myself, because right now it is a thousand to 10,000 times cheaper, but that's obviously not sustainable for decades. But I, I right. do think an order of magnitude is reasonable based on marketplace dynamics and competition. So we'll see. It's an open question. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was uh, so kind of the exact research in this area. I, I, I'm not familiar. Uh, even the file cone story I didn't hear previously. But it would be super interesting, as I already noted in the in the chat, to see a really detailed requirement analysis, right? Because this would then uh, enable to map out the roadmap. You know, what, what What do you need? Why do you need it? Why is there a high probability? There's never a certainty by high probability that this is going to be a suitable solution in the future, etc. Yeah, I think it would be fascinating to see, to just kind of do the comparison between that, AWS, and Quite frankly, I think other um, other storage platforms, especially those specifically tailored to science, could be interesting as well. Although I don't think they have the same feature set as AWS, and you're probably just better off using that. But yeah, it could be fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I've been and, and the comments there were also very, very correct. Uh, I've been using AWS. I mean, all, all of the cloud providers, and they are painstakingly uh, expensive and not not only expensive but um, they have a lot of hidden costs there's like a running joke you don't pay what you use you pay what you forget to turn off and I think they're based their business model around uh, obfuscating things um, and it's it's definitely not uh, I would say a really scalable uh, solution. That, that addresses reasonable needs. So I would be super interesting to see like what are the other alternatives there, et cetera, but also being skeptical, how how much difference can this really make? Meaning how much difference different can, can Falcon actually be to what, what AWS is offering? It'll be fascinating to see. And I think one of the points that's interesting is the compute over data portion, because all of Filecoin is basically archival. Um, they don't really have a lot of hot storage for information. So there's a chance that we do still use AWS as a part of the architecture for our solution around pieces of information that are pulled on a semi-regular basis. That's, I think Sino would probably be better to talk to that, but it's a mix of the two. And that being said, I think a lot of it depends on how well Bakoyao, uh, which is Protocol Labs' compute over data functionality, can work and how well some of the other compute over data platforms can integrate. Like uh, John is a huge fan of Gridcoin and has been working with them for quite some time. So yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see. I think all of these pieces will definitely play in. Um, my hack, am I hogging the, the chat? Maybe some, somebody else wants to ask something or jump in. Oh, no, you're good. Go for it. Yeah. Um, what do you think is then? Because we are, we also mentioned the collaboration with Research Hub and 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 potential working there. I think from the user perspective, you are guys handling it great. Still, I think there is a lot of unknown unknowns in the terms of what what's going what what a very good arc is going to need. Yeah. And, my question is, um, how do you how do you plan on de-risking these features of the arcs that are going to be only clear after the fact, right? Only after the, the, this needs to be actually built. Hi, everyone. Hi, Chris. Well, I think that one's actually probably a question for Chris. And there are definitely quite a few features in the arcs that we have to think about further and kind of have to work out. Part of it is just doing it and putting something out there. But I think your suggestion about a potential yeah, just proof muted handsome bubble gun. Is to... everyone doing all right after this uh, noise explosion? 
Uh, yeah, can you hear us, Chris? Can you still hear me, everybody? Uh, I think Chris just blew up. Yeah. I don't think he can hear us, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Uh, can we can hear you. All right. Great. So yeah, thanks, uh, Noah, for uh, coming in and contributing to our community. I appreciated your question all along the day. Sure. As I said to uh, yeah. Handsome Bubblegum, um, I'm going to be maybe boring you a little bit, but hopefully you're going to be patient with my ignorance. Um, and one of the questions that I posed and the bubblegum kindly suggested that you might be suitable for that. I was just interested, um, as I noted, like um, how to make sure that the arcs and the arc portion is built around, um, you know, the kind of the unknowns that you don't really uh, know as of yet, meaning like when you start building these um, communities, like there's going to be a lot of features that you cannot anticipate. So my thinking was as soon as there, there can be these beta collaborations with research hubs or whoever is trying to build a community around it, that would be a really good roadmap to navigate the future developments. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, we want to partner up with existing communities and see what they're missing in terms of the feature set or, or necessities. And essentially, our, our strategy is around uh, for this is around uh, um, collaborating with pilot projects with existing research communities. Um, so that's that's really the, the way we've been thinking about it. And um, we do have a couple of features planned out for the ARCs, but mostly we need to just have an open mind and explore what these communities need uh, to do their work. And I think there's, there might be a lot of variations between communities as well. So this is also a risk factor we have to anticipate. There, it's, I don't think you know science for curation validation is really one size fits all because science has such uh, different types of cultures all around. Does that mean that you are going to be adjusting and changing your DSI nodes depending on which exact scientific community you're addressing. So for example, I can imagine that let's say pure biology, chemistry uh, won't be needing a lot of code. So in that case, this additional overhead functionality might be you know, too, too cumbersome. Yeah, so I think, um, so the, the arcs essentially operate one level above the DSI nodes. So the DSI nodes are essentially a flexible format where, where scientists can add uh, various what we call article linked data objects. So this can be code, this can be a pre-registered report. For some communities, adding images is very important. For others, less so, uh, just like with code, right? So for some communities, code is very important. For others, less so. So here, uh, we want to cast a flexible and broad net. Now, at the ARC level, this is where uh, communities come together to essentially be able to verify these DSI nodes and to comment on them, provide peer review report, uh, provide essentially attestations that they've been uh, verified and certified by these, uh, by these groups. And this is where we anticipate that there will be quite a lot of heterogeneity in uh, the needs of these communities. Definitely makes sense, but I'm I'm also not really uh, familiar with with these communities, at least public ones. I I mean, besides Research Hub, would you say that there is any other prominent ones? Uh, yeah, you could actually say that every single scientific journal is its own community. Right, right. I mean, hundred percent. But I would say any any uh, prominent ones that are trying to move into the D side direction without being, uh, you know, pushed into into this. So they are already trying it. Yeah. So there, there are there are a few out there. There's a um, a project by the same people, I believe, that have done eLife, which is called Societies. So this is also the idea of creating uh, communities of curators of scientific curators. There's um, different, 
different communities uh, around uh, expeditive peer review process. And I think for this, it's called, um, I have a tip of the tongue. I don't remember the name of that community. A Zap Bio, I believe. Yeah, there's a Zap Bio. So there's there's a couple. There's a couple. I don't think the DSI uh, label is useful in that case. I think the better label is that these communities are attempting to find more efficient workflows to verify and certify pieces of published research, right? So that I think is the is the is the better broader framing here. This is very interesting. I would like to also point because my background is essentially ML. There has been a really great journal that now, I mean, you can call it journal, you cannot, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's essentially all around what you said is publishing great research contact uh, um, uh, information. It's called distill.pub. I don't know, maybe somebody's familiar with it, but they oh, are. Oh, yeah, I love distill.pub. <laughs> it's really the best in class. Uh uh in in my opinion um the thing is so so the issue with distill.pub was that the operation the, the unit economics was really really poor so uh all of these articles were beautifully handcrafted by absolute lovers of of science and communication and um the difficulty with that is that the unit economics like the cost of actually creating one of these interactive beautiful uh, articles was very very high and um, that essentially uh, caused a lot of barriers in adoption for that specific model. Um, in general, though, the machine learning community, I believe, has been at the absolute forefront of seeking alternative uh, models of verification and credit. So you have, for example, platforms like Papers with Code, right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of papers in machine learning that are still published without code, and it's a lot of question marks around this. Like, why would you even publish a machine? Well, you, you okay, fine. There's there's like uh, interesting theoretical derivations you can do on gradient and things like that. So that there, there's a case for it. But for most of that research, uh, having the code available is very important. And so there's a portal called Papers with Code that essentially, uh, I think it's Facebook that runs it. And they want to, they essentially are bundling papers with code, like just like the name suggests. There's another one which is called Hugging Face, which is absolutely fantastic. And the Hugging, Hugging Face is uh, allowing uh, machine learning researchers to create APIs from their work so others can play around with their models and create a, a more composable uh, um, science in the, in the sense that you can chain different models together. You can do a lot of different uh, interesting things. There's another one that's just uh, appeared lately, recently, I think it's called Replicate, replicate.com. And they're also, they're essentially doing uh, a similar uh, approach to Hugging Face where they're uh, exposing APIs so that others can use the models, run the models and pay for GPUs by the second. So yeah, so in general, the, the in, in the machine learning community has been even so successful and so influential that it even <laughs> managed to change the UX of, uh, of uh, the archive, which is not a small feat given that uh, it's, a, it's a very conservative organization. So they, they added, you know, uh, um, code uh, linked to the data and things like that. So yeah, I mean, this is absolutely a, an incredible community that has been doing a lot of innovation when it comes to uh, scientific publishing and communication. Well, I was I, I mentioned the still.pub explicitly because they self-published one article that I'm just posted in the chat in 2020 called communicating with interactive articles. And essentially they argue exactly for this point of the value and the communication add if you include th these sorts of uh, elements in, in, in your article. Hence my kind of question slash feature request for you. Do you think this is something that you could tackle um, in, in the future as part of the DSI node, essentially allowing um, existing articles to, to embed these sort of interactive visuals more easily? So I would say the answer to that is yes and no. So um, what do I mean by that? So I, I do think there's tremendous value in having these interactive graph. The question is who does them and who pays for them, right? So I think that's a, that's a delicate point because it's a lot of, in, in this particular case, it's Node.js, it's JavaScript, it's D3 or other types of toolboxes for that. It takes a lot of time to produce these uh, interactive graphics. So that's the part where um, I'm saying, essentially, we're not doing that. On the other hand, on the other hand, creating interactive uh, articles 
And I think here the answer is absolutely yes. So you can imagine being able to link in your manuscript either an HTML page or a, or a PDF that you can link, uh, let's say, you know, you can link code, you can link data, you can link maybe a video of, uh, of your method, let's say if you run a wet lab. So that's uh, essentially the question boils down to this. How can we create the mac maximally interactive articles and documents while at the same time minimizing the unit economics to the max so that a regular scientist can make his article interactive without expanding, you know, tremendous effort in creating these beautiful and breathtaking uh, um, interactive figures that uh, Paper and Code has done, right? So yeah. I think that's, that's my take on it. Interesting. That's very, maybe I'm just going to shut up a little bit so somebody else talks. No, I mean it's great to have your perspective. It's really uh, the, thanks for joining. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a breath of fresh air, and I really appreciate it. So I'm happy to take as many questions and discussions and extend around these topics. I'm a big fan of papers with code. Uh, the big question is really how how to reduce the how to improve the unit economics of this approach, and I haven't found an answer to this. The answer to this is well, you can drastically reduce the unit economics, uh, but you can't make it as cool. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure regarding the tooling for these visuals, and so I'm really not deep uh, in, into the whole, um, I would say, visualization slash um, better communication through through the same. Uh, I'm not sure if if there if there is like a, an opportunity to make these cool cool or useful toolings that that you can then embed. But yeah, as I said, it's probably. Uh, it's probably an expensive uh, ask. Yeah, I mean, imagine every time you make a figure, you have to essentially uh, uh, code JavaScript, right? So right. it's 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 really really tough on the unit economics. Now you could think you could say, well, maybe there's alternative to this. You know, you can have reproducible notebooks, right? Reproducible notebooks, any scientist can do that, and then you can uh, click through. The results you can essentially vary the parameters you can do a lot of uh, other cool things you can even produce you know uh, pseudo interactive uh, figures with notebooks so that's possible um, and that's an avenue we're exploring but then again not even every scientist uh, even computational science is is, is um, you know accustomed to these approaches yeah agreed um So what are the, well, if, if you, I don't know how much you can share, but it would be interesting maybe to hear just a high level summary. Uh, what, what was the, the current feedback from the alpha testers in, I would say, most pressing topics that came up uh, constantly? Um, <laughs> uh, so, so we, we don't have all components, um, supported. So I think a lot of alpha tester wanted to add a YouTube video or something like that. So that didn't work. Um, I think the there's, there's different classes of feedback. We've had feedback on, uh, essentially the placement of buttons on the interface, which is super valuable because it actually, uh, it was excellent feedback that we've, uh, already answered to, um, there's feedback around the upload procedure, which I think could be clearer. I think, you know, when you design a product, you really want to make sure that the first mile, that first, you know, 10, 15 minutes that a person spends on it is as polished as possible. So that's a place where we have to um, to essentially improve uh, the flow. I think there's also a case to be made that we can have an accelerated research object creation interface where you can just, you know, copy paste a bunch of links. It will pull all of that data, put it on IPFS. Uh, you then need to uh, tag it with metadata. And uh, essentially having that flow nailed down better so that it, it reduces the cognitive load on the users is something that uh, we want to do. Um, but in general, the feedback has been super helpful. It's just uh, that we need to essentially add more, more components and uh, expand the feature set from the alpha to the open beta, which we'll have uh, this winter. And if you want to learn more about alpha feedback, we have uh, Carla here, who's been uh, and and uh, and Eric, who have been running a lot of the alpha testing sessions, and we have a uh, long collection of really interesting and uh, valuable commentary to improve our product. It's, yeah, that's that's very cool. Uh, I think yeah, it's super interesting. Um, 
What, what's your uh, sample size of, of the up until now current uh, testers that you had? About 20. 20 is, uh, I, think, uh, I think, was that right, Carla? 20 alpha testers? Yeah, I think 22, something like that. Very cool. Um, I also posted uh, like a, a, a half an hour ago a question in the in the uh, maybe we can discuss it now shortly in the foundation AI um, chat. So long story short is I was in in the in the DSI foundation there is there's the third pillar AI and science, and I think you you anyway said that that data that would be utilized i mean one of the data sources is definitely what what would come out from your decentralized knowledge graph um, so my question is when do you think that you will uh, make this data available uh, such that these questions that you posed in the in the thread for the ai for the meta science can actually be start uh, being answered and tackled um, and yep. so that, that's kind of the first one. And the second one is these replication markets and prediction markets for social science. How do you see that differing from, from what will be done there? Yeah, I mean, it's super interesting question. So um, we actually have an incredible data set to already tackle these questions, um, that part about AI. Uh, one of the applications that I am and we are ex extremely passionate about is the ability to automatically generate metadata from research objects. And uh, that would have a tremendous level of advantage, not only in terms of like reducing user, user uh, uh, improving user experience, reducing user friction. Imagine when you upload a, your manuscript on archive, that it would auto generate your metadata. And that's, uh, that's something that would be very valuable for science as a whole. And this is doable today because there's a data set called the general index, which is essentially a 120 million, I believe, scientific article that have been processed into n-grams. Mm -hmm. And we have out there uh, um, essentially uh, very interesting research projects and publication about creating bottom-up ontologies for knowledge based on abstracts of published article within specif specific time windows. And once you create these ontologies from by extracting, uh, by looking at uh, similarities uh, between terms used in these abstracts, you can then essentially create classifiers that takes as input an incoming paper and classifies it into one of, uh, uh, essentially uh, tags it with uh, terms from a controlled vocabulary represented uh, representing one of these ontologies. So it is possible to take some of these existing existing approaches in metadata generation that have that are currently restricted to the sub to, 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 to the field of computer science and extend them, right? So they've been constructed on about five million uh, abstracts and extend them to 120 million abstracts within with a specific time window in a way that uh, we can address a much, 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 much broader collection of uh, scientific works. So this is this is why you can essentially already uh, start uh, building out some of these solution, answering some of these questions uh, using this existing data set. Gotcha. And how do you see how do you see it? Uh, I would say there's there's overlap, but how would you define the overlap between these uh, uh, replication markets, science prediction market, etc.? Yeah. So science prediction markets are tricky, tricky questions. Um, they're tricky for a number of reasons. It's very hard to get the participation you'd want. Um, it's uh, if you if you essentially uh, combine that with uh, markets that uh, involve real money, then you have some uh, pretty serious regulatory uh, um, issues to solve. And there's also the problems of liquidity fragmentation. So so prediction markets um, don't work well for questions that have too much of a restricted audience. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you take a paper and you say, hey, does this replicate or not? You might be able to run a prediction market if it's, let's say, a new COVID therapeutic, right? Because you'd have sufficient interest to, to essentially gather the required liquidity on both sides of the market to run that test. Then the question is, of course, who adjudicates what is a successful prediction, right? Uh, sorry, a successful rep, uh, replication. And uh, that's a that's 
Uh, you know, I want to say it's more of an art than a science, but no, it's actually still a science because you have to look at, you know, comparing effect size, looking at statistical power. There's a lot of uh, uh, fine grained details that essentially make the system quite uh, um, vulnerable to disputes, right? So the problem of arbitra uh, uh, arbitration and the problem of liquidity fragmentation, the problem of having a restricted set of interests is, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's un insurmountable, but it essentially restricts the classes of, applic of, applica of applicability to a restricted subset of uh, scientific uh, um, discoveries. Interesting. Um... We have a great scientist in our advisory board. Um, she's been uh, running a lot of uh, really cool uh, prediction market experiments. Um, uh, yeah, you should check her out. I'll, I'll send a link to your, her work if you want to learn more about yeah, applications yeah. of prediction markets in the context of uh, reproducibility. Definitely. Appreciate that. Yeah. And, and when do you when do you plan to uh, what's because it it wasn't clear from the from the um, uh, from the website the research centers is there any timeline for this that you would think is um, the, <laughs> yeah the website is still very early it's going to go through a considerable uh, redesign and uh, upgrade of the content it should be done in the next two months. And it, everything will be launched next year, essentially, with the research centers. Uh, we've already launched a, a research seminar where we have a bunch of really great and interesting speakers lined up. So that's our first initiative. The second initi initiative will essentially be around uh, these research centers. And what we might do, and I think this is there's there's a lot of good reasons to start thinking about that, is essentially setting up um, uh, impact prizes, right? Impact prizes for solving specific question, doing high quality work that advances the cause and uh, uh, brings you know new insights, new models uh, on how to improve things. I mean, it would be kind of funny if you did it through a D-side note, because if I understood correctly from your demo, you can essentially grant funding through asking questions directly there, or did I misunderstood this? Yeah, so essentially there's there's a, a validation button that you can press and you can add funds directly. For example, you could request a peer review. You could request uh, verifications of the badges and attributes as attestations. You can request a replication, although, I mean, this is, um, of course, it's very costly, right, to do a replication, especially in certain fields. So this is non-trivial. There's a non-trivial amount of uh, um, things that need to be uh, put in place before we can actually do this at scale. Um, but yeah, essentially, you can interact uh, with the scientific record directly. So imagine if you're an archive, there's or like bioarchive, there's a new paper that comes out. Uh, claims, you know, there's uh, uh, HIV inserts in COVID, like we've seen, you could essentially call for like a, a, a expedited peer review process and add a big validation grant that would ensure that, you know, the world's best expert in the topic would chim in and essentially dissect the claims and the data provided by that article in a way that would be timely and also fair for scientists, because now they would start seeing the actual fruit of their labor being manifested as value that they can capture. Uh, uh, and, and essentially use that value to do things like sponsoring tuition, uh, sponsoring uh, travel grants, you know, uh, um, paying wages for PhD students, and all of those things. Um, I think uh, th th this 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 is this is awesome. But what uh, one feature that I liked about Research Hub is there is the so-called questions that you can ask and then offer bounties. So instead of you know peer reviewing, replicating, reproducing, you can. Uh, completely independently without any paper being submitted you can ask i wouldn't say general questions but concrete questions and in in, in your case it would be you know concretely uh, for the for the um, uh, research centers uh, how can you can you please let's say key research questions um, how can we automate the, or aid the collection of metadata, right? So this could be kind of proof of the platform by answering the questions that the platform already needs. Yeah, this is super cool. I like the idea of uh, having a uh, uh, incentivized question system to fuel uh, research centers. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that's a, that's a good idea. 
And if yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> I got another question, I had I wanted to anyways write this, but since since we are here, so um, somebody I uh, guess you you uh, you all, but but there was anyways um, on on the roadmap on on your website. Um, there is the the, the cat cat tools that um, I find interesting, and here's my question: Do you plan to have this modeling um, modeling agent based systems embedded into the um, Arcs interface? So let's say that I'm a community that I want to enable, and I'm not sure what what my policies are going to look like and what's the impact of them. Are you going to give me tooling, a very abstract tooling that will help me determine are my policies valid and useful? Uh, so, okay, so we, I was thinking of CADCAD and other agent-based simulation systems for simulating the scientific validation and curation process, but I do like uh, the idea of extending it to, 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 to other, other fields. I think in general, um, um, there's a case where we might put too much emphasis on these formal tools and simulation tools, especially given that um, scientists, you know, they have so-called thick communication channels, which essentially, uh, uh, because it allows for communication outside of a system, it does uh, uh, make a number of assumptions made by simulations of agent-based simulation particularly, uh, in some cases intractable, in other cases much more complex. So there's a case to be made that um, if we use those, you know, it's like the map is not the territory, right? So we do have to be mindful about, uh, um, you know, miss, uh, making too broad claims based off these simulation tools. Um, but in general, yes, I think the, the, the idea of extending uh, uh, the, the study of complex systems and the academic publishing industry in general and scientific validation, the produce, production of knowledge is an extremely complex system and would benefit from modeling agents that are involved within that systems with sets of predefined strategies that they can play according to. So I'll give you one example. Um, you can think of the peer review process as essentially being um, two things, right? There's a, there's a there's a component which is a certain strategy space where a peer reviewer can either you know give his honest feedback or gatekeep, because at at the end of the day uh, uh, they are your competitors. So you could essentially uh, um, a gatekeep you know entrance into a journal, which uh, which happens all the time in the high impact journals, uh, or you could you know play the game honestly and essentially uh, um, give honest feedback. The another dimension is whether you want to expand effort on it or not, right? So it's like well you can feign effort, uh, you can read the paper, you can you can go extremely into details and give highly productive feedback, or you can just skim through it and say well it's not novel enough for this community, right? Right. So there is there's this two by two uh, strategy space for peer reviewers. Um, and I think, you know, another part that's interesting is thinking that every reviewer, you know, has a model of the world, model of what is valid, what is invalid. And they essentially, you know, they take these dense inputs, which are, you know, works of, of, of scientists, and they try to distill it into sparse inputs that then editors can use to rely on, they rely on the sparse input to make their final decision, right? So this is, you know, when we talk about agent-based modeling, that's really the way we've been thinking about it in that really restricted space. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy to explore and talk about, you know, uh, uh, other types of extensions of the system, for example, funders, uh, um, how funders track research outputs and all of these things. I think there's a lot of really interesting avenues there. Yeah, uh, agreed. I think I was I was coming from a point of, of an ARC user, right? So, so I want to curate a community. Um, I can I, I am left with the choices of, of my um, at the end of the day policies and governance that I want to instill there. And there was I'm going to post it now in the chat. There was a really interesting uh, medium article on how you can use CatCat to actually model these policies. I mean, of course, exactly what you said, you are not hopefully stupid enough to take this on, on, uh, on the face value like this shouldn't be something that you model, but this should be a recommender system. In a sense, right? It should tell you, you know, this is a at least quantitative recommendation that I can give you, and you may choose to ignore it. Um, in a sense, let me how do I share? I totally agree with you. I'd love to see the article too. Let me let me send it here. Just a second, I'm a little bit not. Oh yeah, 
it's here. Um, yeah, it's it's super cool. Um, I, I love the article um, where they explained essentially how you can uh, how you can aid in in the decision making. Um, very interesting. I guess yeah, but these are all kind of features for features in the future. You said that that the arc is planned for twenty twenty three. I believe. And uh, just kind of meta question: How is generally this community call structured? Is it is it free for all, or or is there any agenda? So we do have an agenda every time to kind of spur off a discussion. Um, but you know, it's it's uh, we're also happy to 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 entertain alternative uh, um, um, discussions. I think the, the the goal of the community call, more than following an agenda, is really about uh, um, building knowledge, about exchanging ideas, and and all of this. So while an agenda does guide the conversation, uh, it's really a conversation starter. Got it. And yeah, I mean, t today's topic is around everything around the OSTP memo issued by the by the the White House, and it's about uh, how this is going to change the business of scientific publishing. So, uh, I mean, that's something we can we can all dive into if you guys are ready. Or I'm also happy, you know, to 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 talk more about uh, some of the questions you might have, Noah, and uh, some of the comments you made, and some of the comments I made earlier. Yeah, we can we can let's maybe um, well, let's jump to the to the planned agenda and I can jump back later on. I read also this paper. I believe somebody posted it in the, in the chat, and one of the comments was uh, don't count on the government to build the tech solutions. Yes, yeah, this is uh, this is the, there's there's so so to 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 ground this conversation. Um, there's the OSTP memo which was just issued, uh, I believe, last month, which essentially mandates all publicly funded research uh, as to be op uh, open access. So they don't use open access because this is a word people can't really agree on. They use the word uh, um, not free access, but I think it's, yeah, open access, not, uh, or what was it? I forgot the word, but there's a specific framing for this. But essentially, uh, the big consequences of that is that they're also removing embargo periods, right? So embargo periods on published papers were a way for uh, getting the information before it came out to the public and having exclusivity when you were a publisher. So this is a, a essentially an earthquake in the in the publishing industry space. Another big part of the OSTP memo is the requirements about storage and archival and making accessible uh, data that results from publicly funded research. So there's now a big emphasis, uh, big emphasis on this idea of sharing and preserving data in a way that is tractable with provenance, and that's also uh, uh, machine actionable. So these are these are some of the, the the big points around the OSTP memo, which is very strongly worded. So it doesn't wor use words like should uh, or off. It says you know must. And that is a very strong injunction, especially given that historically uh, these memos have had been much more uh, had been met much more, let's say, in concert with stakeholders, which very often means in concert with publishers, essentially, and uh, also you know university libraries and others. And this time they are essentially uh, they're essentially you know light, lighting the fire to the powder keg to see what happens, right? And so they've issued that memo with a very, very strong wording, giving organizations, funding organizations that fund for above $100 million of, of research, the obligation to essentially make all of the research that they fund uh, uh, public access. That's what I was looking for earlier. And with data preservation, archival and access plans for all of the, uh, the, the research artifacts associated with that research. So it's, a, it's essentially a, an earthquake in the publishing industry. And to put that into perspective with that declaration that was linked earlier in our community, a lot of scientists are essentially concerned that uh, what does this mean? Well, that means that the gold open access model 
so-called named gold, essentially involves a fee, right? It's the APC. It's called the Article Processing Charge. Uh, most people call it the author publishing costs, <laughs> but uh, the official ter terminology acronym is Article Processing Charges. And these charges typically range between, you know, $2,000 and $10,000 at the very, very high end. And so if you're a lab and you publish, you know, maybe 10 articles, 15 articles a year uh, with your group, um, pieces of research, um, that essentially ends up uh, eating away a um, substantial, substantial portion of your, your, your grant money, right? So if you're, you could, you could be spending anywhere to, you know, from, from 20K to, to 80K in article uh, processing charges. And so there's uh, uh, the backdrop of that, and this is something everyone is aware of, and everyone is, is somewhat concerned about that, is that there's going to be steep increases in these APCs over time. And uh, of course, there's all sorts of factors, you know, used to, to justify these steep increases, like increased compliance costs and so on and so forth. But essentially, there's this there's this uh, um, concern, right, that um, the 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 prices of these uh, article processing charges will increase and increase and increase because journals ultimately they compete for prestige and prestige has a property that uh, it can be captured and at you you can reach a level of capture which at some point uh, scientists stop being price sensitive they're like well I'll I'll pay however much it takes to get this article published in this specific journal. And so that creates uh, essentially the types of uh, value-added services where publishers compete for prestige and not features, right? When you think about it, it should be competing for features and not for prestige, but they compete for prestige. And so there's that, that the, the backdrop of that is that there's this one widespread anxiety around, around that specific uh, approach. Now, what these, uh, um, this organization has been asking for is like, well, let's let the government build it. Right. So government, please build an infrastructure for uh, public access for open science. Um, this is not new. So Europe uh, as a whole has been pushing extremely hard for open access and uh, public access to 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 out research outputs. And they've been having efforts like Plan S, like other ways, you know, to try and constrict and restrict the amount of fees and, and add uh, caps to, to how much, you know, publishers can charge uh, for open access and different levels of mandates. So this is in Europe, this is nothing new. They're actually more advanced than the US when it comes to um, open access. Um, what Europe has done is that they've been building out the so-called European Open Science Cloud, right? which I believe is a billion dollar project over multiple, multiple years, I think even a decade. And the idea for that is to have a centralized infrastructure for all scientists in Europe that they can all benefit, you know, from storage, from compute, from uh, uh, in, have creating interoperable research objects that are fair, that facilitates the reuse of the artifacts and, and all of these things. So on papers, it's a brilliant idea. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's really, really great. Um, the issue is, of course, is that so when you want to build, you know, when the government seeks out to build these large infrastructural IT projects, these tend to suffer from tremendous cost overruns, you know, from relatively poor user experience and all of these other factors. I mean, if you go on the website of the European Science Cloud right now, um, you will see exactly what I mean. Essentially, it's... Um, there, there's it, it ha the governments have no has notable difficulties in building that that those types of platform. We've seen this when when Obama had the uh, uh, universal healthcare plan coverage uh, in America when they build out uh, uh, this this healthcare website for the government. You know, ended up costing billions of dollars or something absolutely ridiculous. And so, this is one of the main challenges, right? So on one side, uh, the government does have the capacity to allocate vast amount of resource. On the other side, because of the fundamental nature of the tendering process and the organizations that answer the tenders and follow strict requirement guidelines on the, the product development, it's a very top-down slash waterfall development cycles that involves a tremendous coordination costs between a large variety of supplying firms, right, that supply the software, supply the labor, which tends to lead to uh, large degrees of inefficiencies. 
And yeah, so that was, I think that was a big part of the conversation around, uh, around that. Now the European Science Cloud is far from finished, right? It's still, it's still essentially a large, um, it's still a large uh, um, IT effort, it's ongoing. They're issuing new tenders uh, uh, every couple of months to continue building it out. Um, and what essentially these, these uh, that memo, not that memo, but the answer to the memo that petition calls for is uh, something similar from the government, essentially. So that's the context around the OSTP memo, around the uh, um, petition, and around the European Science Cloud. Couple of, I don't want to be hogging the mic. Maybe somebody else wants to jump in. Well, I do have a just one specific question around the European Open Science Cloud. Are they building an entire infrastructure? Like, how much of this is them putting in servers all around Europe to support all of this, versus how much of it is formatting existing cloud infrastructure providers to be? I guess a little bit better at accommodating scientific infrastructure. No, no, no. So they want to they want to build a federated infrastructure, and so they have to do essentially a, a cloud kit that other organizations can deploy. So that's so they're not about they they don't want to let's say oh let's repurpose the Paris uh, uh, chemical science you know repository, but let's actually provide you know. Uh, an infrastructure stack that organizations across Europe can deploy to participate in this in this network, right? So it's a federated infrastructure. That's how I understand it again. I mean, again, it's a huge project and there's a lot of complexities around it. Um, and this is just my reading of it right now. So as I understand it, it would be like a permissioned version of a peer-to-peer -peer network, similar to kind of what we've described previously with libraries running their own infrastructure stack in a way that's Hon connected. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. Uh -huh. I'm not going to answer this. Um, I would need to dive more into it. I don't. I doubt the peer, the term peer-to-peer -peer is is what it's doing. I think it's more of a hey. Uh, let's have uh, um, infrastructure providers across institutions essentially com conform to to certain interoperability standards and run certain layers of that cloud so that it can interoperate seamlessly. So I think that's that's more where this is going. Gotcha. That makes sense. And thank you, Noah. Feel free to jump in with questions. It doesn't. It's it's okay. Your your questions are fantastic. Yeah. Otherwise, what's going to happen is I'm going to talk a straight monologue for 17 more minutes right here. So, <laughs> no worries. Which you enjoy, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, just maybe a short remark slash question, and then back to my batch of questions. Um, Regarding this project, I mean, I mean, if you can count on one thing from European Union is essentially more regulations. How much do you think that this is actually going to be a enabler versus a regulatory tool? European Open Science Cloud Initiative. A great question. Um, it's going to be both. It's really too early for me to answer this question. I mean, I don't have, I haven't like dived deep into the docs of the, the, the details, but yes, I mean, from the European Union, you can be sure that it's going to be uh, essentially what, what is done very, very well is essentially coming up with new rules and regulations. And uh, that's true. And this is, this is, can be very, very stifling as well. So um, yeah, it's an open question. Very curious to see how this evolves over time. You'd think that, the better role of government in that case would be to essentially promote or essentially fund grants for open data standards, adopt the best types of open data standards, and then essentially regulate around that and not necessarily build IT infrastructure from scratch. But uh, yeah, the, all of those are open questions. Let's see how it develops. I just know from experience that you know some colleagues of mine using the European Science Cloud, I mean, they've been pulling their hair out. So it's not, it's not a good experience right now. 
I think to, to conclude this discussion, I would just point to a very recent initiative from European Union. The, I think the best thing that they can do is subsidize this to a private company. So for VC investment, I think they now partner the, the, the EU grants and, and hold the investment bodies. They partnered recently. This this was a news I didn't dig deep, but they partnered with some private uh, uh, VC company in, in order to essentially uh, aid them in the whole decision making. So as you said, I think there's a lot of bureaucracy that they just cannot surmount themselves and subsidizing it into a entity that can actually do this might be a better option. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think I think though there's there's very very uh, good reasons to be fearful of private companies in this case, right? Because let's say it's not something you want to outsource to a private company that will let's say, you know, control the entirety of the scientific record, all the research outputs, all the data and all of this, right? Because they would be need to be strictly, strictly regulated as they would be in the position of monopoly. So, and this is what you see essentially, Elsevier is a monopoly of, on, on scientific digital information, right? That's how they have profit margins of like 37%. That's higher than Apple and, and Google and all these other companies. So there's, there's a strong case to be made that you have to be very, very mindful by involving uh, uh, um, private companies into owning or controlling part of that infrastructure and so that's why we've been uh essentially thinking hey maybe there's types of architectures out there that are actually resilient to capture right they're resilient to the formation of monopolies they're resilient to uh, uh regulatory capture and one of the ways we've been thinking of achieving that is let's say hey what if we unbundle the data layer from the application layer, right? What if we have vast data lakes, lakes of data indexed on an open on an open record, that any uh, entity wanting to create an application, for example, a preprint platform, for example, a funder, uh, a, a grant tracking system, for example, a library access and search interface, uh, could ex essentially or journal even. So all of that that those those let's say. Uh, um, uh, applications that have traditionally been accompanied by their own uh, database, uh, which is it's essentially a walled garden. How about if we unbundle both and we allowed for the application layer to essentially pull data from this data lake uh, according to its own needs, according to the, the, the requirements of its constituencies and according to its own standards, right? So I think there's, if we manage to, to essentially lay the groundwork for, for this type of architecture, we can prevent capture of the point which generates the most value, which is the data, right? And if you can prevent capture of the data, you, 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 you create uh, an open competitive market on the application layer, which is what you want to have. You want to have people compare, c compete for feature, com compete for search, compete for uh, 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 retrieval. So, yeah, so, you know, those, those are ways we've been thinking about that. But how do you think that this, um, you know, separation between the data and the application layer is actually different from the whole DAP premise? Isn't this the whole premise be behind the DAP uh, development, etc.? Yep, that's exactly the whole premise behind the DAP development. <laughs> So you're essentially you're saying you know we are going to allow this in a uh, in this particular vertical of uh, scientific data. Exactly, exactly. That is exactly the DAP uh, model. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> now back to some other questions that I had. So I think what's very interesting, and I would suggest or or propose here is the things that you talked about um, in in the talk is that. You know, instead of having these static objects, I mean, sure, that these I know this is all about it. But what I found super interesting is, um, yeah, instead of having one whole body of of work and one whole paper, what you could have is um, essentially partial elements of of the same that could be regarded as 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 valuable scientific information so you know you know certain commentary uh, certain uh, graphs certain images certain descriptions and wh why do i deem this interesting um these sorts of semi structured data is that uh they and then be you actually know that this yourself these sorts of data fractalized data points can be used to create a better version of the impact factor for example 
Now, my question is, have you ever given any thought on how this might actually play play in reality? I think this is very important and interesting because if you can argue successfully, of course, some of these arguments are going to be projections, but if you can argue successfully on how this data and metadata around the D-side nodes and everything that's around it can be used to make a better impact factor, and with that, you know, potentially generate better incentives, I think this could be a big, big, not only big PR, but big nudge towards this whole space. I couldn't agree more. I absolutely couldn't agree more. And actually, that was the first motivation uh, with starting this project. Um, one of the things we are extremely uh, interested in is so-called badges from organizations, right? So you have badges from the um, Open Science Foundation, for example, uh, Center for Open Science, which says, hey, the methods and the material, the code, the data for this particular article are open and they can be downloaded here. Uh, that's, this has extraordinary value. The ACM, the uh, Association for Computing Machinery, has similar badges saying, hey, Artifacts are available with this uh, computer science abstract, or artifacts are reus reusable, they're well documented. Uh, journals like the American Economic Review actually do a full reproducibility check on every article that they accept. Um, so these are, these are all very, very valuable alternative metrics to essentially what is the scholarly attention economy, right? Number of citations. And the problem with all of those systems, and there's a, there's a big problem right now, is that there's no workflow, there's no established workflow and interfaces to easily verify that they are essentially deserved by the author who self-selects the attributes of his research, right? So the ACM, for example, has uh, um, essentially groups at conferences that do verifications for these attributes. Uh, it's extremely time intensive. They have to deploy it on their local machine. More than half the time, the code doesn't run. It's like a lot of debugging. It's they have to set up the environment. It's very difficult. Um, journals like Psychological Science, which is uh, one of the leading journals in psychological in, in psychology, they have adopted the badges from uh, the Center for Open Science, but nobody really checks them, right? So it's like authors can say, "Well, my material is open, my code's open, my results, you know, reproduce my data is here." My, but actually. There was a, this article recently showing that more than 50%, I believe, I don't remember the exact number, uh, were, you know, it was debatable whether this badge was uh, 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 deserved by the author, right? So this brings us to the problem of uh, verification, right? And workflows around verification, because if we do want to create alternative metrics, we have to remember that as soon as the metric gets incorporated by a funder in his decisions, it's going to get gamed. And so we have to be very mindful about that, and we have to create trusted indicators. Right? So, so we have to create trusted indicators, and uh, one of the ways to do this is by having these arcs essentially verify that the badges that the authors have self-assigned uh, to themselves are deserved. And if we can manage to do this, then we can do exactly like you say, we can start nudging scientists and nudging funders towards recognizing alternative forms of credits. And one of the most interesting applications is, hey, hey, how about we expand the system, right? How about we say there should be a badge when everyone reuses my data, right? Mm -hmm. Not just as a citation, but as a specific batch, because there's something, you know, there's something that is broken in the way scientists reuse each other's data right now. And we can essentially extend the system to things like proof of reproducibility, right? So the, the results of this paper or this, this, this work of science is actually completely re reproducible from the artifacts that have been posted. You can also have badges that says that a scientist has added a restricted data component, which essentially provides a path to access and the conditions to access to data that is restricted cannot be into the open that is necessary for reproducing or extending the work, right? So you can think of this essentially as scientific articles being enriched beyond citation metrics with markers that essentially form a set of attestations around attributes for these objects. And if you have a verification layer, you can then verify that these attributes are deserved and feed information to funders that they can trust to make better funding decisions.
Yeah. Can I can I add to that really quick? Please. Uh, because it, it's a really good question. Like, how do you um, how does this fix the the metrics of what makes good science? And it doesn't. Like the the short answer is it doesn't. But it what it does what it does is it provides an infrastructure where anyone can make a metric, and then people can decide for themselves which metric they think is good. So it could end up that after all this work, we end up with the same impact factor metric, like score scoring system that we had before. But in order to get to that result, we're gonna have to wade through a, a marketplace of experiments around metrics. And so one person, and any, this could be anyone, it could be nature themselves, it could be Elsevier, it could be me, it could be Sina, it could be you, just experimenting with what makes good science, pulling information from that data lake that Chris described, which I thought was very neat, uh, and then saying, because of X, Y, and Z, this publication has high impact. Because of A, B, and C, this publication has good impact. And there's, there's an infinite sort of possibilities of arrangements of variables to create these different metrics. So it's yeah, so I, th I think you know it's not going to it's not going to fall back to the 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 same impact factor because I think impact is defined very narrowly. Uh, so re I wouldn't consider reproducibility as part of impact, but that's perhaps just a semantics and definitions uh, uh, thing. Of course, if it's not reproducible, I mean, the impact should be essentially it's a multiplier of impact, right? It's like your work doesn't replicate. Well, you take whatever impact you have by citations, out metric and everything, and you multiply by zero or minus one because you've done damage, right? <laughs> so uh, you could think of them as even like weighting factors, right, around impact. Absolutely. Um, um, but more generally, uh, yes, I think one of the applications that's very interesting is for funders to be able to define their own badges, right? So funders might have specific mandates, like let's say I want the scientists that I fund to post their code and post their data and post their work in open access. And I'm creating this badge, which for example says, welcome trust funded scholar. And there is now I have a willingness to pay for verification of this information as a funder, right? So I'm completely willing to take a piece of published research from a scientist I fund and essentially, you know, spend, you know, $1,500 or something to have a group that I trust of competent experts verify that the terms of my funding are being respected by that researcher, right? So you can think of that system as a way for funders, foundations, research organizations to create alternative markers of, of what they consider to be high quality, high impact, quote unquote, research. A couple of remarks, and this is gonna be a burst fire. First idea that, that I was thinking at, towards the end, I and I wrote it in the chat, um, wouldn't it be good, maybe this is already possible, to annotate these recordings upload it to YouTube. But I feel like this is definitely going to, as the whole you and the space keeps growing, this is going to be hopefully repeated. And it would be great just to point future discussions to the to these conversations. That's point number one, just to think about it, ignore it. Back to the back to the point of, of the of the um, constructing the, the metric, uh, the impact factor, I think one of the great questions that you should pose is exactly in the research center for AI or, or generally, uh, um, what would be an interesting uh, yeah, novel metric that is actually a weighted weighted one with the with the current impact factor, and this could then spawn, you, you know, a complete completely new direction that that people. But there needs to be a trigger, is, is what I'm trying to say. I think people are not going to be even aware that this is possible with the current, uh, with with what you guys are building and what what data you're capturing. Yeah, no. So, so I mean, I, I'm. Um, I, I think it's a. So, so we have three research centers. We have one around scientific validation, and I think this is the one where it would fit fit uh, uh, more neatly. And this is going to be a big topic, right? It's, it's essentially, you know, what is the space of all possible uh, indicators of quality in research that should essentially be rewarded? But right now, essentially, funders and research organizations have blindfolds on, right? And that's a big problem. 
And so how do we remove the blindfolds, right? How do we give them clarity on, on, on what they're funding and what are the outputs of that and what is the, the degree of open uh, open science surrounding it? So it's going to be a big research question. I think next year is going to be where we really start diving uh, very, very deeply into this. I think, you know, our one of our dreams is to, you know, uh, work with the DSI foundations to create like a rich set of attestations for research and that can you know that can form let's say a, a some sort of common standards that then funders can compose on to decide what matters to them because a funder in the life science might have different priorities that the a funder in the, in the, in engineering and uh, we need to like account for the plurality i think this is an important word right is a plurality of uh, alternative impact metrics that have value, uh, uh, not necessarily between fields, but within, really within fields. And if we can cr map out uh, this plurality and allow funders, let's say, to choose like the bucket that matters for them and to have that information that is fed to them live, it would add a lot of value in their ecosystem. And then scientists would have a clear incentive to strive for these markers of alternative quality because they see that funders are paying attention. Right. But it's it's a chicken and egg, egg problem, right? Um, because you, you 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 need the funders to go for it, but then you know you need the other ones to actually care about. I, it's a super important and interesting one, but what which comes first? I feel like. Um, do we have time for a final question, or should we cap it at? Some... Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, maybe a final one. Um... So I would say the most interesting problem that I feel can be addressed through this movement is motivating fundamental research. So, and how do you do that? I mean, one, one, one saying is, you know, besides the impractical, weak ones like reputation, whatever is monetarily. So what if you had people that can actually benefit, you know, in perpetuity, with with the fundamental research that they that they've done through you know maths physics whatever, and you know if this could be addressed, I think this would be a, a zero to one uh, jump that that could change a lot of a lot of narratives. Do you think? Have you thought about this? I mean, obviously, but have you thought about this concretely of how would this pan out through your developments? And do you think also it's a very important and interesting point to address? It is a extremely important point. Um, it, it has a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, um, let, let's say difficulties associated with it. I'm uh, a big believer that essentially right now scientists are being underpaid uh, uh, by a pretty substantial amount. I think that's not a tolerable system uh, in general, especially for early career uh, scientists. So one of the things we've been really thinking about is like, hey, how can we allow these scientific communities to, to make uh, uh, additional income, right? additional forms of monetary compensations that benefits them directly? So the way we've been thinking about it is not so much based on the science you produce, but more on the service you do to curate the science that's being produced, right? Which is the this whole idea around um, validation grants. Now, when it comes to benefits of the science you produce, there's of course a huge gap, right, in the fact that you know scientists do create billions of dollars of value, but but their work, you know, being in the open then gets used and monetized by private companies, you know, to start out uh, uh, projects that sometimes succeed and generate tremendous value for the world. Here, there's a, a a very tricky path, right? It's very difficult to say, oh well, you know, I should have royalties around this, and this kind of like goes back into the problem of IP which again is kind of tangential to your earlier point because this is not something that's really relevant for fundamental research more relevant for biological science for applied research right mm. so the issues around generating let's say a, a return for scientists that have created you know extraordinarily valuable pieces of fundamental science is something that's possible but for this to happen you do need a credible funder mm. right so you do need a credible funder who's willing to act as like the essentially 
um, as a as a buyer of like some some sort of derivative that is produced out of that fundamental research. Let's say you know there's you know some some tokens or some contracts or something like that that's produced out of it, and you need a funder to keep purchasing those in order to allow for the the, the knowledge generators, right, the fundamental knowledge generators to uh, capture that value, right? So it is possible. There's a Let's say the devil is in the detail because there's there's you know very pragmatically speaking as soon as you introduce explicit financial ex incentive for example to populate the platform such as design notes you run into the problem of identity spoofing right you run into the problem of people you know essentially scamming saying oh i made this 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 great research and in fact it's not the person's name and it's just you know some scammer from who knows what country that just posted the work so you have to be very careful about the introduction of these uh, explicit incentives which brings us again to the problem of like you need a validation layer, right? You need to uh, verify the identity solutions. You need a validation layer to verify the work. And once you've built all of this, right, this this kind of complex stack, now you can actually start having mechanisms to accrue uh, uh, values and rewards to scientists that participate into the endeavor. And that's where it really gets interesting, right? Regarding the validation, though, um, didn't you say I might have uh, then misunderstood this, but I believe that you mentioned um, Holonym for securing. I don't, I'm not familiar with the service. Maybe I'm just missing the point here, but uh, wouldn't you yeah. take this into account? Absolutely. So uh, securing identities. Is, is is very important very fundamental if we can have robust systems that secure identity without exerting too much of a user experience pains uh, then we can you know I, I think at the end security is like a gradient right it's not zero one you're not doing kyc on everyone but you have essentially a gradient of trust around around that person being who he claims he is mm -hmm. right or she is so i think that's that's the best we can hope for and perhaps these systems are 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 strong. Will will be strong and robust enough for us to let's say, well, if you're above, you know, eighty percent, uh, you're eligible for X Y Z, and if you're below, you're not. Please complete your profile. Some something like that, you know, in a very pragmatic application development sense. Right. Um, so it is possible. So if we if we do manage to find, uh, uh, let's say, you know, if if a holonym uh, works out to to really really well, and we do manage to get this this gradient of trust, we can do have certain cutoff levels where we can provide these explicit incentives uh, um, while preventing the system from being abused and exploited. Because one of the worst thing you want to see as a scientist is someone you know posting your work and getting the rewards for your work, right? So this is something we have to be very very careful for the let's say the type one errors here. Right. But I mean, th th that's 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 a problem for, I would say, future work. That's anyways a problem, it, it, no, no matter what solution you use. But I think for the current or existing work, the, the, as, as you already described, you would be using gateways to essentially port the existing uh, authorships and claims to the to the open library. So uh, but this problem that you now mentioned is a problem generally independently from what you're trying to build. Yeah. It's a it's a gateway problem. Yeah, right? it's a gateway problem. And um, but you know we can't like expect people to just build up these gateways without us uh, providing you know what's what a prototypical gateway looks like, how it can like function more or less. So you know we kind of have to solve it for them too. But the hope, of course, is that at some point you reach escape velocity and there's an ecosystem that's rich enough, interoperable enough that people build up their own gateways and come up with better identity solutions or or better systems you know to prevent identity spoofing fraud and all of these things from happening so that we can have you know some 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 degree of of, of uh, um, certainty that when we do attribute you know explicit rewards to scientists because hell you know they deserve it uh, um, that we don't run into uh, these issue right okay thank you thank you so much for for answering all the questions no, no, no. Thank you for joining. It's been a great pleasure interacting with you. Thank you so much for engaging with the community on our Discord channel. These have been very, very relevant questions. And it really it really transpires that you, you know, you know what you're talking about and you're passionate about the topic. So this is very, you know, it's it's really on our side. So thank you for joining. Definitely. Yeah. Happy, happy to talk. All right, we'll wrap this sucker up then. Uh, this is great. Just so you know, Noah, they 
Uh, these things are recorded and uploaded to YouTube. I don't know if they're time stamped or annotated, um, but we'll look into that for sure. Uh, I'll, I'll throw the YouTube channel in the chat. Uh, and then for everyone else, I mean, there's a lot to talk about here. Noe was asking some great questions. So continue the conversation in the Discord. And we'll see you next week or on the onboarding call, I think is on Wednesday. Yeah, so before everybody leaves, uh, one last quick announcement. Uh, we just published our very first podcast episode of the Future of Science podcast with the DSI Foundation. It's a really interesting conversation between Philip and our first guest from the Future of Science seminar, Gustav. And I'm going to post an announcement on the DSI Foundation Twitter like right now. So please check it out. You can find the link there. Leave a like and uh, feel free to retweet. Right. Yeah, and if, if you want to uh, get more context for the podcast, listen to the, the seminar that he gives, because the two go so well together. It's a great format you guys built. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Fantastic. Really excited to listen to the podcast. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and I'll see everyone next week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.